imagery goes back to the very beginning of GIS. Mm -hmm. uh, when you think about it, mm -hmm. uh, imagery has always been one of the foundational elements of GIS. All the fundamental layers that we care about in GIS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laurie. Thanks for joining on uh, GeoBiz. I would like to first ask a general question in terms of, yes, uh, imagery has become a, a very integral part of uh, GIS. Mm. How, how important is it uh, to have uh, uh, imagery as one of the components? Well, imagery goes back to the very beginning of GIS. Mm -hmm. uh, when you think about it, uh, mm -hmm. imagery has always been one of the foundational elements of GIS. All the fundamental layers that we care about in GIS mm -hmm, mm -hmm. essentially have come from imagery. Mm -hmm. So terrain, um, land cover, mm -hmm. buildings, roads, all of these things come exclusively from imagery. So you can say, in a way, that imagery is the foundation of GIS. Mm -hmm. What we feel excited about at Esri is that imagery is taking an even more prominent role mm -hmm, in mm -hmm, GIS, mm -hmm. becoming uh, the new face of GIS, mm -hmm. where the map of the future as we see it will not just be a two-dimensional uh, vector map, but it'll be a three-dimensional photorealistic image map. Mm -hmm. So we're very, very interested in driving that vision. But yes, uh, imagery has become multi-source, multi-format. So uh, how is uh, Esri's platform integrating a variety of uh, these imageries in a more seamless uh, manner? Yes, yes. Well, this is, this is one of the strengths of having a very robust platform that has mm -hmm. been built over uh, decades. Uh, mm -hmm. and so uh, you're exactly right. It, it's important to not discriminate against any particular source of information, particularly imagery. So we want to be able to, and we are able to, uh, easily accept multi-scale, multi-source, multi-resolution, uh, multi-band imagery mm -hmm. and bring all of this into a GIS. Uh, the important thing that we do with it is to turn it into useful information products. Exactly. So this is uh, where our users gain value mm -hmm. uh, in their GIS by turning uh, imagery data, pixels, into meaningful information upon which you can base decisions. So mm -hmm. uh, we've pretty much uh, populated imagery capabilities throughout the entire ArcGIS platform. Uh, uh, in the core platform itself, plus all the extensions, plus all of the uh, uh, apps, uh, imagery is a very uh, rising star within mm -hmm. the, uh, the mm -hmm. ESRI system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, pretty interesting that yeah. you have uh, extended this capability to the entire uh, suite of products. So uh, how is, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes, it's important to have the data and then to be able to turn it into some actionable information and also analyze along with other attribute data. Right. So how uh, is this uh, happening in the uh, ESRI products? Yes. So one of the key strengths, beginning with large collections of imagery, is uh, enterprise imagery management, what we mm -hmm. call EIM, or enterprise mm -hmm. imagery management. Uh, this is where the Esri ArcGIS platform is able to uh, organize and manage uh, huge collections of imagery, hundreds of thousands to tens of millions of images, mm -hmm. and then dynamically process them on the fly. So this is one of the unique capabilities of the, of the Esri platform is its ability to dynamically produce information products as you access them. So mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it's a tremendous step forward architecturally uh, compared to the traditional form of downloading, file open process, intermediate products, you know, you lose resolution each time the old way. That's sort of the post office, mm -hmm. uh, whereas we're more like the email, the internet. Uh, how about uh, when you say dynamically presenting uh, uh, the information in a useful format, how about uh, when the data itself is uh, very real time or near real time because uh, that is was a need for uh, constant monitoring and analyzing aspects yes. of it. How yes. are these uh, uh, integrated into a very real time and dynamic GIS? Yes, yes, so we have a very, very important new capability. Uh, it's actually not that new. We've had it for a couple of years. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a geo event server. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're also now about to release a geo analytics uh, extension mm -hmm. that takes these real time feeds and processes them dynamically uh, mm -hmm. and produces information products in sort of like a situational awareness environment, a common mm -hmm. operating picture, if you will, mm -hmm. using this geo event technology. So, for example, you could geo fence an area, you could establish what we call geo triggers, you know, so when a vehicle, let's say, comes within a certain radius or uh, a threat is within a certain distance of something, you can set off uh, alarms and messages. 
and it can trigger other geoprocessing events. So mm -hmm. this is where GIS is really gaining momentum. I'm moving into the fourth dimension uh, time and even the fifth dimension, which is adding additional intelligence to it. So you mean to say the context? Yes, it absolutely sets the context, but it mm -hmm. also gives us insight. Mm -hmm. So uh, this uh, is another area that we're uh, exploring with this technology, is to look into these huge collections of what some people call big data, mm -hmm. and then do essentially not only visualization of the big data, but big data analytics. Mm -hmm. Where are the patterns? Where are the hotspots? Where are the significant events that are happening in these huge clouds of data? Uh, and increasingly, these things are happening dynamically using the, the Esri platform. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, okay. very timely uh, technology because the sensors are basically capturing uh, the entire Earth. Uh, everything that moves uh, at all on the surface of the Earth, we can map, measure, and monitor now with these collection of sensors. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to keep that data as dynamic as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, when we talk about, it, we have talked about imagery, we have talked about m multiple uh, source mm -hmm. imagery, but these days imagery is also terrestrial and more uh, indoor as well, yes. right? So how is the Esri platform gearing up to cater to these uh, kind of imagery yes. as well? Yes, very good question. So we have a true 3D architecture now uh, in the ArcGIS a platform. Uh, years ago, maybe 10 years ago, you could probably have thought of it as more of a 2.5D, but now we're actually a, a full 3D architecture, which mm -hmm. allows us to go inside the building, capture mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. analyze things, visualize things, and animate things uh, in 3D. So it's just another data type, or does it require uh, a specific uh, capabilities within the platform? Uh, it's all a native part of the platform capability, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. we've uh, invested, for example, in uh, companies such as City Engine, uh, mm -hmm. the procedural company with a uh, new technology called City Engine, which allows us to synthetically generate with rules new three-dimensional cities, mm -hmm. and then using uh, some of the new point cloud capability we have principally from LiDAR and terrestrial uh, LiDAR sensors, we can go inside the building and look at the 3D within the building. Mm -hmm. So are we soon there uh, where we can do a, a 3D anal uh, analysis on a GIS of an indoor campus? Uh, yes, uh, campus? yes, this is, this is a, a capability that's coming now. We have the architecture that supports structuring the data, accessing the data, and then uh, the analytics are, for example, uh, let's say you want to go from the first floor um, office to the basement emergency exit in a fire situation. So we already have the topology mm -hmm. that allows you to do that routing. That's, mm -hmm. again, the power of, let's say, a GIS mm -hmm. as compared to, let's say, a CAD system. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the advantages that GIS analytically has over CAD, which is just more of a capture and, and rendering system. Yeah, but I think uh, the more effectiveness comes when it is more uh, uh, e in a user-friendly format yes. on a mobile or a handheld device, yes. especially like the, you have said in an emergency situation, yes. the the information or the intelligence is readily available. So uh, is uh, is as we looking into all these uh, uh, entire life cycle of uh, a particular aspect? Absolutely. This is and this is something that's not actually new for us, but we've been working on this for a while, and we have a very strong suite of apps uh, mm -hmm. for all different types of devices. Uh, we have a new initiative uh, called Web App Builder. It's a new offering that allows you to quickly and easily build your own apps. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, web templates mm -hmm. uh, that come bundled with the system. They're like Legos. You can kind of click them together and make your own interesting uh, app. And then for the developers who want to take full advantage of a particular device, uh, let's say an iPhone versus an Android, uh, we have something called App Studio, yep. which allows you to leverage and exploit all the native capabilities within that particular device. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the users of the future, we feel, are going to extend beyond our traditional strength of GIS professionals and, and move further into the area of uh, the entire enterprise, the knowledge workers, the executive level, uh, the citizens themselves uh, are all interested uh, in accessing a common information model. And this is really a structural and fundamental shift forward uh, for the platform. Um, traditionally, we've had a geodatabase-centered uh, architecture, but now WebGIS, the, the new architecture of WebGIS, is a geoinformation model at the center of gravity of GIS. So this doesn't require you to download data into it, this connects to existing distributed services, live services that are spinning. So as these services get updated, 
your web map and your web GIS gets updated dynamically on the fly. Mm -hmm. So this is really a, a paradigm shift. It's a major evolution forward in GIS, and this is extending its value and access to many people beyond just the GIS professionals alone. Okay, fantastic. Uh, another aspect which, uh, not too recent, but uh, ESRI has now become a rich source of, uh, a rich repository of imagery with ArcGIS uh, yes. online as well. Yes. How is this uh, panning out uh, to be uh, for the entire solutions business? It's really remarkable. We today, I believe this is correct, that we have the world's largest collection of online maps mm -hmm. of any organization That's in the world. That's a pretty quick uh, build up, uh, I guess. It's huge. Because it's, I think it's been two years uh, yes. that has really uh, launched it's this. It's accelerated very, very rapidly. And mm -hmm. we're talking about maps uh, as well as imagery. But uh, principally, uh, I think we have more than uh, a billion uh, map request a day. I mean, it's it's huge. This is just accelerating uh, dramatically. One billion map requests. Uh, yes, uh -huh. that we have. Uh, it's and it's doubling every year. Mm -hmm. So we have. I would probably say hundreds of millions a day. And mm -hmm. I think uh, last year we did uh, more than fifty billion uh, map mm -hmm. requests. And so this year it's. It's well more than double that, so it's mm -hmm. dramatically increasing, uh, mm -hmm. and this is good. This is good for our users. It's good for uh, our partners. And several uh, of them uh, are freely downloadable. Yes, many of them are freely available. And on the imagery side, uh, of course, we have a huge uh, collection of high-resolution imagery for the entire Earth. We have uh, uh, roughly for the entire land surface area of the Earth, which, mm -hmm. as you know, is about 150 million square kilometers. We have very rich coverage for the entire Earth, much of it at one meter resolution, some of it at 30 centimeter resolution, uh, or 50 centimeter resolution. We also have a global elevation services, so we have quite a rich uh, collection of online uh, map and information, imagery information, and users expect this information to be part of their GIS. So you quoted saying that something has really arrived when it truly disappears. <laughs> that's, uh, that. that's something very interesting. Yeah. How do you see GIS becoming more ubiquitous and actually disappearing? Disappearing, right. In the early days, in the 1960s and 70s, computers were mainframes and they were in a big refrigerated room, the computer room with the computer staff and white coats and skinny ties. and we'd have to submit a deck of cards to them and beg for a <laughs> result. And uh, so um, as things evolved, technology evolved, uh, CPUs and processing and storage and everything evolved, uh, these computers began to find their way into devices to control things, uh, taking away the uh, unreliability of mechanical things, all right? uh, switching to digital. Uh, I'm sort of a car person. I love classic cars, and uh, it's a hobby of mine. And I think automobiles were the, one of the first areas where computers um, began to uh, populate and support some of the things that we all use. Uh, specifically, uh, up until the early to mid to 1970s, all automobiles uh, had carburetors. All right, but in about the early to mid 70s. These became replaced by fuel injection systems, which were much more reliable, ultimately. Uh, and so computers found their way into our cars. And then, of course, they found their way into your kitchen. Uh, you have a radar in your kitchen. Most people think, radar, isn't that the weather? You know, where's the radar in my kitchen? Well, it's your microwave. The original microwave oven was called the Amana radar range. And that's mm -hmm. because it uses microwave radiation. radiation. But that's just another form of a computer and a sensor. And then of course uh, your telephones now are computers disguised as a phone switchboard, uh, your television set, your thermostat, these amazing little Nest thermostats that are Internet of Things type of a device. So these computers have now uh, populated, digital controls have populated throughout our entire society and our lives and we don't call them computers anymore. Hmm. Our phones, you know, smart devices. So they've, they've arrived because they've really disappeared and they've become an expectation that's gonna be part of our, our ordinary life and making life easier, more comfortable for us. So I think the same trajectory is happening with GIS. GIS is becoming more and more popular. It's becoming more and more used. Location is an expectation. In your device, you wanna know where you are. Uh, GIS has already arrived and disappeared in one sense in that through GPS, one of the societal changing things is we're never lost anymore. Mm 
<laughs> 30 years ago, there was the idea that you could get lost. <laughs> now, no one's ever lost. You have a home button on your phone or your laptop and it basically routes you back to home. You can find amazing things that were impossible to find earlier without it. So this is how benefits of GIS are beginning to percolate through. We'll see organizations saving time and saving money and saving lives. Uh, and so this GIS and geography is, is really changing uh, the face of society. We call it applying geography everywhere. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the power and the promise of GIS is to apply geography everywhere for the benefit of society. And uh, we're seeing these benefits more and more, not just in business, not just in technology, but uh, important projects like eradicating polio, uh, dealing with Ebola, uh, major uh, uh, situations in disaster response with earthquakes like Nepal. Uh, GIS is really an action player in every one of these events. And it's becoming a new normal, a new expectation that it will be there to help me. Yeah. Thank you so much, Laurie. Thank you very much.